So we're really interested in two broad questions. The first is, what is it that regulates the virulence of plasmodium? And the second question is, what constitutes effective immunity to malaria? And what we have shown is that the mosquito vector is master regulator of both. And by controlling parasite virulence and host immunity, it's the mosquito which dictates outcome of infection. And that's what I'll go through quickly today. So in the plasmodium life cycle, there are only really two things I want to draw your attention to. The first is that the mosquito is the definitive host for plasmodium. So this is where you get fertilization, this is where you get meiosis, and so it's within the mosquito that you get genetic recombination. In the mammalian host, it's the blood stage of infection which is entirely responsible for all of the morbidity and all of the mortality that's associated with malaria. And one major limitation of malaria research is that this pathogenic blood stage of infection has been studied in isolation. So experimental infections have been initiated by injecting serially blood passage parasites into a host for analysis. But it's been known for decades that serial blood passage of plasmodium, whether through rodents or primates or even humans, universally increases the virulence of the parasite, which is suggesting that this development within the mosquito vector acts to regulate plasmodium virulence. So to look at this, the model we used is a, is a rodent uh, malaria parasite called Plasmodium shibori, that's PCC, and we use a clone derived from isolate AS. And what we can start with are these cryopreserved stocks of serially blood passaged parasites, which can be injected into mice for analysis. And what we developed was an efficient way to take these serially blood passaged parasites and get them back through the mosquito. So what we could then do is we could actually initiate infections in our, in our laboratory mice via mosquito bite. And in that way, we could take a single genotype of parasite, this Plasmodium shibori AS, and we could compare it before and after mosquito transmission. So when we do this, what we find is that compared to our serially blood passage parasites, which are in red, which give us this high level of parasitemia, so they'll give us routinely between 20 to 30% peak parasitemia, so it's 20 to 30% of all circulating erythrocytes are infected, we get this attenuation of parasite growth after mosquito transmission. So we'll get perhaps 0.5 to 2% of our red cells being infected. And at the end of this acute phase of the infection, as the infection progresses to the chronic phase, what we find with our serially blood passage parasites uh, is that essentially they're cleared very quickly from these mice. So this each line represents an individual mouse, and the line basically represents the fact that these mice have patent blood stage parasitemia. So by about 30 days of infection, almost all of these mice have cleared their parasites. What happens with our mosquito-transmitted infections is that this acute phase of infection is cleared even more quickly, within about two weeks, and then the parasites drop below the level of detection. But if we keep monitoring these mice for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 days, we start to see these recrudescent populations of parasites re-emerging in the circulation. So what mosquito transmission does to these blood passage parasites is it attenuates their growth in the acute phase of infection and gives a low-grade chronic recrudescing infection. And what that means for the mice is pretty impressive because our, our mice that have this injection of serially blood passage parasites become incredibly sick. So they have this incredible hypothermia, severe weight loss, severe anemia, a lot of metabolic disruption, which is shown here by looking at these liver enzymes in the circulation, and a lot of cellular liver damage, which is shown by this tenfold induction of alanine aminotransferase. Whereas the mice that are infected via mosquito bite show very little clinical symptoms of disease, at least looking at them in their cage, they're nice and happy, running around, you can't tell that they're infected. And they show no loss of temperature, they show no weight loss, they still have some anemia, of course, as, as the red cells lies as the parasites egress. They have a little bit of metabolic disruption, but they don't have any of this liver damage. So clearly, mosquito transmission attenuates parasite growth, but it also attenuates parasite pathogenicity. So one of the important things to, to point out right at the start is that this has nothing to do with the root of infection or the parasite dose. So it doesn't matter whether you give a single mosquito bite or 100 mosquito bites, or if you 
isolate sporozoites from the salivary glands and you inject them intravenously or intradermally, or if you give 10 sporozoites or 10,000 sporozoites, you always see exactly the same phenotype, an attenuation of parasite growth and pathogenicity. And the other important point to make is that this, this doesn't depend in an individual host on that parasite moving through the skin and the liver and triggering some kind of alternative host response. Because what we can do is we can take our serially blood passage parasites and once they've been through the mosquito and we infect our mice via mosquito bite, we can wait just a couple of days until the blood stage of infection starts again. And then we can isolate these blood stage parasites that have just been mosquito transmitted. And in this way, we can do the direct comparison. Now we can compare serially blood passage parasites with blood stage parasites that have been recently mosquito transmitted. And when we do this, we see exactly the same phenotype. So our serially blood passage parasites give us very high parasitemia and make the mice very sick, whereas our mosquito transmitted blood stage parasites have an attenuated growth and attenuated pathogenicity. So clearly, mosquito transmission changes this blood stage parasite. And this could be some kind of selection event. So it could be that our serially blood passage parasites, which have been passaged about 35 times over the last 30 years, have become this very heterogeneous, phenotypically heterogeneous population. And essentially what mosquito transmission does is it selects for those parasites that are highly transmissible, but just happen to have a low virulence profile. And so to test whether this was a selection event within the mosquito, we took our serially blood passage parasites and then we, made, we, we basically recloned these parasites. So we made 25 clones of our serially blood passage parasites, although I'm only showing five here for simplicity. And we tested their growth potential and their virulence in vivo before and directly after mosquito transmission. And in every case, our cloned parasites after serial blood passage have this high virulence profile and high growth. Whereas after mosquito transmission, all of these clones have attenuated growth and attenuated pathogenicity. So this isn't a selection event. But instead, as the, as the parasite goes through the mosquito and develops, it undergoes some intrinsic change. So vector transmission is intrinsically modifying the blood stage parasite for the start of the next blood stage of infection. So I don't have time to go through any of this today, but what we could show is that these mosquito transmitted blood stage parasites would elicit a completely transformed host immune response. These mosquito transmitted parasites would elicit an enhanced innate response, enhanced adaptive response, enhanced humoral immunity, and importantly, they would also attenuate systemic inflammation. And what we could then show is that it was this transformed host immune response which was responsible for this attenuation of growth and pathogenicity. And we did this by doing these transfers into immunodeficient mice. So again, we're either injecting the serially blood passaged parasites into mice, or we're taking blood stage parasites that have just been through the mosquito vector and directly injecting them into hosts. And then we do the direct comparison. And what we find again in the wild type mice is that these blood stage parasites that have just been through the mosquito have this attenuated growth, attenuated pathogenicity. But when you take these mosquito transmitted blood stage parasites and you put them into a mouse, that, for example, is defective in its ability to make good innate and adaptive immune responses. Suddenly, these parasites can grow to 20% parasitemia to start to make these mice very sick. If you take these parasites and you put them into mice that have absolutely no adaptive immunity, you get hyperparasitemia and all of your mice drop dead in 10 days. So mosquito transmission does not attenuate the intrinsic virulence of these mosquito transmitted parasites. But in wild type mice, these mice very rapidly control parasite growth and pathogenicity. So now we have a system where we have exactly the same parasite before and after transmission. And before transmission, it elicits a very inappropriate immune response because the immune response can't control parasite growth or virulence. Whereas after mosquito transmission, the immune response is exactly what you would want to generate with a vaccine. Controls parasite growth very quickly without eliciting very widespread immunopathology. So the question, of course, becomes, what's the difference between these two parasites? And to look at that, we used RNA sequencing. So now what we're comparing is our serially blood passage parasites with our blood stage parasites immediately after mosquito transmission. And essentially what this figure represents is the fact that the, the vector, the mosquito, 
is controlling the expression of 10% of the plasmodium genome in the erythrocytic cycle. So here we have all of the genes that are upregulated in these mosquito-transmitted blood stage parasites compared to the serially passaged parasites. And here are all of the genes that are upregulated in these serially blood passaged parasites compared to mosquito-transmitted parasites. And the most intense regulation is in these large subtelomeric multigene families, and particularly in the peer multigene family, which in Plasmodium shibodi is confusingly called the seer multigene family. And this is important because the peer multigene family is the largest in Plasmodium, and it's conserved from rodents to primates to humans. And importantly, it's thought to encode antigenic variants. So now we've linked vector regulation of antigenic variation to parasite virulence and host immunity, and therefore outcome of infection. To summarize what we've, what we've shown, we find that mosquito transmission regulates parasite gene expression in the erythrocytic cycle, and this intrinsically modifies the blood stage parasite, so that that blood stage parasite then elicits a completely different immune response, and it's that immune response which then controls parasite growth and pathogenicity. And what we've done is shown that the peer multigene family is directly associated with parasite virulence and host immunity, and is therefore potentially a very good candidate for looking at developing a malaria vaccine. So, I should say that all of this work was done at the National Institute for Medical Research at Mill Hill, which is where I was before I moved to Edinburgh last year. And this was done together with Jean Langhorn, Bill Jarrah, Priska Levy, Thibaut Bruget, and um, with some help from Vipker and, and Irene. And all of the RNA sequencing studies were done in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, particularly the group led by Matt Berryman. And before we had our insectary, we had to go drive to Imperial College and collect all of our mosquitoes and pots so that we could do our experiments. So for that, I thank Bob Sinden and his group. And this was funded by Evie Millar, the Levy Hume Trust, and the Wellcome Trust. Thank you.